Hello, I'm uh, Dr. William Zogby, Chief of Cardiology here, and I'd like to welcome you to our Cardiology Grand Rounds from our studios here. Uh, just a few items before we get started. We would like this to be interactive as usual, so if you are in the United States and you want to text us, you could uh, text DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607. Or if you're on the web, you can join us by the web. Go to polev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com and enter DeBakey and enter your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, well, today I think we're going to have a really a special topic and uh, certainly a special guest lecturer for our Grand Rounds. Uh, he does not need any introductions and uh, he's a dear friend over the years and uh, truly a leader in cardiology. This is Dr. Jerome Bax, who is Professor of Cardiology and Director of Non-Invasive Imaging at Leiden University Medical Center in Leiden. And this is where he received his medical degree and completed his cardiology training. He received his PhD from the Free University in Amsterdam on the topic of myocardial viability, a topic actually at that time we were working on together. So it's really nice to see that. Since then, he has supervised more than 70 PhD fellows on different topics related to the use of non-invasive imaging in clinical cardiology. Dr. Bax has long served in the European Society of Cardiology in numerous capacities, including chair of the Cardiology Practice Guidelines Committee and chair of the Scientific Sessions Program. He is co-director of three ESC books on cardiac imaging he served as ESC president from 2016 to 2018, and he was honored with the silver and gold medals from the European Society of Cardiology and with the Douglas Zipes Award of the American College of Cardiology. He has recently received the Distinguished Scientist Award from the ACC. He is currently associate editor of Jack Imaging, and where we serve together, and the European Heart Journal Cardiovascular Imaging. He sits on the editorial boards of many professional journals and previously was an associate editor for Jack and the European Heart Journal. Dr. Bax, as you know, is extensively published. His major research interest is in applying various non-invasive imaging techniques in clinical cardiology, including coronary artery disease, arrhythmias, and heart failure. And this is actually the topic of today. Jerome, what a pleasure having you among us today. I uh, wish we have you in person, but I know that will happen at some point in time. Uh, but it's, it's great to have you, and thank you for taking the time to share some of these topics with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen, um, see if that all works. Is this visible for you? Yes, we can see you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zogby, for this fantastic introduction. I, I feel a little bit, I don't know what to say, because in life, I think it is is not so much about this achievement. It's that you try to help next generation to, to continue what we're doing. So that's why I invested a lot of my time and efforts in, in helping that. And by now we have uh, included in the program almost 100 people that have uh, that are doing the PhD or have done the PhD. And that in the Netherlands and internationally will hopefully help to continue the interest in cardiovascular research. One thing that we see in Europe, and I think you also see in the United States, is that because of the pressure all the time, there is, a, there is some decline in, in uh, cardiovascular research, not so much the basic, but more the clinical. And I think that's some area where we try to, to help people to get into a good program and based on that, hopefully continue the things we have been doing. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Well, I would have really liked to be with you, but hopefully we can do it next year on a different topic. Um, Dr. Zogby, thank you again for the invitation. You asked me to talk about the future of imaging. So that's, that's very broad. That comprises almost everything. So I say um, I'm going to this time focus on coronary artery disease, something we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I think that is probably in most people's interest. 
I'm going to talk a little bit on and the background of ESC guidelines, because that's what we work in Europe a lot with. And so in 2019, we did this ESC guideline on the diagnosis and management of chronic coronary syndromes. So you see it correct. We do no longer call it a coronary artery disease, but chronic coronary syndromes. And the reason for that is that we have different phases and you cannot just say um, this is coronary disease or that is coronary disease, stable or unstable, acute or not acute. It's a natural history process of chronic coronary syndromes. And that starts basically here with a sub subclinical phase. And then there is an active moment and then there is a long standing diagnosis. And it can develop in a very bad way, in an intermediate way, or in a pretty much stable way. A stable way is patient present with coronary disease, eventually it gets revascularized, and there is nothing much in events happening. The cardiac risk for death and myocardial infarction in these patients is low. And then we have the absolute opposite. These patients present with an acute coronary syndrome, needs revascularization. Then over time, another coronary syndrome, again, revascularization. And what happens is that we get into sort of unstable phase. This, this patient has aggressive coronary artery disease. And with that, over time, will come eventually left ventricular dysfunction. And when that happens, heart failure is going to come. I believe that in many, many cardiac diseases, uh, heart failure is the final common pathway, of ventricular dysfunction. Then we have the intermediates where the patient has one time such an event and then afterwise, afterwards, because we have very good medical therapy, interventional therapy, the patient stabilizes. So let's talk first about this subclinical phase. Here we're talking about asymptomatic individuals or atypical symptoms. Nowadays, that's, it's very easy to get a CT scan done. We see more and more patients that come to us uh, where they have been um, self-referred or referred by, let's say, general practitioner in the Netherlands uh, for a CT scan. So these are asymptomatic individuals, atypical symptoms, but they have an elevated risk for atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease. And in these patients, we're talking about screening and early detection. The easiest one to do, and still happens a lot uh, in the Netherlands and Europe, is calcium scoring. And then we got three possibilities. We have a patient with absolutely no calcium, no calcifications. We have a one with a little bit of calcification and we have one with severe coronary artery calcification. These calcifications do not tell us much except that this patient has atherosclerotic calcified coronary artery disease. So it's a marker for the atherosclerotic burden, but it doesn't say much on the individual lesions. If we look at calcium scoring, they come with these numbers. So you see here, these numbers going up zero, 100 to 400 and over a thousand. Zero means no identifiable atherosclerotic plaque. This slide needs to be modified because we realized over the years and we published it in, in Jack in I think 2007 for the first time that patients with an ACS, if you do a coronary CT, you often see that they have already severe non-calcified, predominantly non-calcified atherosclerosis. Then the burden gets larger, over a thousand is very extensive calcified black burden. If we talk about calcium store versus risk stratification, we see in this long-term follow-up from Matt Budaf that if you have a zero calcium score in a huge number of patients, these patients have a perfect outcome. These are patients asymptomatic and the calcium score is done just for screening. And um, we see that if the calcium score is more than a thousand, the outcome is not good, but still, is also not that bad because we're talking about 88%, 90% cumulative survival rate. This is a huge number of patients, 25,000 asymptomatic individuals. So just to summarize, calcium scoring, EBCT, we don't no longer do, everything is done with multi-detector CT nowadays. 
calcium scoring gives you the presence of coronary calcifications associated with increased risk of coronary artery disease, coronary artery events. It's a marker of coronary disease in general, but it's not so much a marker for a specific site. And I think this is the first take home message. It's really not able to identify localized vulnerable plaque. We cannot say based on a calcium score, okay, this patient is gonna have an event relatively sooner or later. I think it's a population risk marker rather more than an individual specific risk marker. I say again, these non-calcified lesions, we do not pick them up on calcium score, but these are the ones we've learned over time are the ones that are really associated with high risk. So let's go back now to this algorithm that I showed you. We're gonna go a step further and we're gonna talk about symptomatic patients. In these patients, the issue is detection of coronary artery disease detection of atherosclerosis, or should we detect ischemia? That is an important question because we got two sorts of techniques or tools. The ones that give us atherosclerosis only, the other ones that give us ischemia. In the past, we used to work always with ischemia detection, but now with the increased use of CT scan, we go earlier. We first do a CT scan to see if the patient has atherosclerosis. And if there's a lot of atherosclerosis, then often we switch to detection of ischemia. These are taken from our ESC guidelines. This is the latest one in 2019 that has focused on this. And we take this stepwise diagnostic approach. So step one is you assess your sympt the symptoms of the patient and you perform clinical investigations. Step two is consider comorbidities and quality of life. Step three is arresting ECG, biochemistry, chest X-ray in some patients, echocardiography at rest. And then we assess the pre-test probability and the clinical likelihood of coronary disease. This is no, no CT scan, nothing. This is just clinical, some laboratory and echocardiography. Here are some things that if they go in that category, they have to follow a different guideline. Unstable angina goes to ACS guidelines. Revascularization futile, we don't need to take the whole way, we just go medical therapy. If the ejection fraction is less than 50%, they refer to you in another part of this guideline. It's a different story. If the cause of chest pain is other than CAD, you just go in another track. This is very important because I do just like you, outpatient clinics uh, in the week. I see on an afternoon about 15, 20, sometimes a little bit more than 20 in an afternoon. And the first thing we do when they come with these things is that we have to look at the classification of suspected angina. So we got typical angina, which meets three of those characteristics, constricting discomfort in front of the chest or in the neck, et cetera precipitated by physical exercise and it's relieved by rest or night trains very rapidly. We have atypical angina if it meets two of those and we have non-anginal chest pain if it meets only one of those. We did a test with this in, uh, in the hospital and we asked five physicians to see five virtual patients presenting so and so and so and we asked them to score them and you see that they categorize them all different. So is what we use, but it is not perfect. Then we need to classify them, class one, two, three, or four. It's the same here. What I call class one, you may probably call class two. So class one is angina only with very severe exercise. And what is severe exercise? Well, the presence of angina during strenuous, rapid, or prolonged ordinary activities, such as walking or climbing the stairs. But again, this is very subjective. Class two is angina with moderate exertion. Class three is angina with mild exertion and class four is angina at rest. And this is, I think, the fundament of the testing, the imaging that we have put forward in the ESC guideline. I think it's reasonable what you see here. This is very low pretest likelihood. This is very high pretest likelihood. Pretest likelihood of obstructive coronary artery disease. So if that is very low, we don't need any testing. If that is very high, we're not gonna mess around with testing. We go straight for invasive assessment. And nowadays we combine that a lot, not just purely anatomical, but we use some form of assessment of the functional severity 
of that coronary artery disease, such as FFR, IFR, etc. The choice of your imaging test is based on the clinical likelihood, patient characteristics, preference, availability, and local expertise. We are not like you. You have one country and you have one sort of hospital. Well, you got different hospitals, but it's rather homogenized. If you look at Europe, we can put forward all this complex testing up to all the way PET and MRI. But when I had to, to chair ESC for a couple of years, I traveled to a lot of Eastern European countries and I saw that they basically don't have much more than an exercise test. So it's hard to make this one for Europe because a lot of um, countries do not have that. Availability is an important issue in Europe. Testing for ischemia, then imaging preferred. And here you do anatomical imaging. So the lower likelihood anatomical imaging, the higher likelihood ischemia testing. Nowadays, one can ask themselves, and you should ask yourself next time you're doing outpatient clinic, is this the right way? Or do I do in everybody immediately a CT scan? Or do I do in everybody an ischemia test? Again, it depends on local expertise, local availability, but also our judgment. What we have in the ESC is this pretest probability of coronary artery disease. This is leaning on three characteristics. H, that has a high reproducibility if we um, detect that with the patient. Gender has also a high reproducibility, but the problem, of course, what I said to you is the typicality of pain. So we have different age categories, as you see here, young age and then 70 plus, then gender, men, women, and then the typicality. So we call it typical, as you saw in the first slides, atypical or non-anginal. And also we have added recently dyspnea. There was an article from Dan Berman in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, where he focused very much on the fact that a lot of patients actually that come to your outpatient clinic do not present with angina, but they have some sort of dyspnea that they present with. And so if you do an exercise test or if you do better an imaging test, you see that a lot of these patients with dyspnea have significant coronary artery disease. The dark green, these ones here, is where imaging is the most useful. The pretest likelihood is more than 15%. In the light green is where you can certainly consider imaging. The pretest probability is 5 to 15%. It is these gray ones here where we should not image. These ones, we should not use imaging. We just go with our clinical judgment. If we look at patients with angina and or dyspnea with the suspicion of coronary artery disease, on top of what we just looked at, the pretest probability, we look also at negative decreases likelihood or positive increases likelihood. Very simple things. Decreases likelihood, normal exercise ECG. No coronary calcium by CT. And again, I say to you, not in unstable patients. In stable patients, yes, but in an unstable patient, we've really seen that a lot of these patients, they present early with a relatively young age, severe chest pain at the emergency room. If you do a CT scan, the vast majority of those patients have more non-calcified disease than calcified disease. What increases the likelihood is risk factors, the usual ones, lipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, family history, resting ECG changes, LV dysfunction, abnormal exercise ECG, and coronary calcium by CT. So you see an echo is done very quickly, and a CT scan also in Europe is done very, very quickly. We know now that calcium score zero is not always benign. And that is why I prefer not to have a calcium score, but rather a CTA if we go that direction. These factors that you saw here are further enriching the pretest likelihood of coronary artery disease and help us to get closer to where we want to be. Then I'm going to take this non invasive assessment of coronary artery disease, which patients sent for what. And this is the work from Patterson 
in JAK 9089. That was already published many years ago, but it's still very valid. We take a pretest clinical probability based on the clinical factors. Then we do the test and we see if the patient is shifted to a lower or higher post-test probability. Let me give you this example. We're first gonna talk about the patients that are at intermediate to low risk. So in those patients, we're looking for atherosclerosis. And it's in this ballpark here where we can do that. And if they have no atherosclerosis, we shift them to the post-test probability very, very low. However, if they have atherosclerosis, we shift them to a higher intermediate likelihood. Let's keep it simple. 51 year old man, outpatient clinics, non anginal pain. What would be the pretest likelihood? So I'm going to take this table that we just discussed, and you see um, the uh, different factors. So he ends up at a pretest likelihood of 11%. So it's the light green, as you see, and we can consider imaging. So we have a symptomatic patient, low to intermediate risk. And the question is, does he have atherosclerosis? Does he need medical therapy and follow-up or can I discharge him here? So we order in that case, non-invasive anatomical test to detect or exclude atherosclerosis. We do a CT coronary angiogram. As I said to you, we do a calcium score always to begin with, but then always combined with a CT angiogram. Here you see such a CT scan. We all do them nowadays. We started with, uh, with 16 slides, then we moved to 64. Now we got 320. I think if you're over 64 or more slides, then you're pretty good in your diagnosis. Then we construct, reconstruct these pictures and these movies. And then we get, I like always to take a quick look at these 3D pictures. Why? Because I see everything here. I see the coronary arteries. Are they in the right place? Are there actually three? Recently, we had a woman coming with only one coronary artery. You see the venous system real quick. And then we go to this multiplanar curved reconstructions, MPRs. And here you see the right coronary artery. In this case, there's absolutely no calcification. Here's the left anterior descending. There's a significant calcification here. There's some non-calcified disease there. And here's the left circumflex. If my scan shows this, nothing on the LCX. Let's assume the first picture, nothing in the right coronary artery and nothing in the LAD. Then this is a completely normal coronary scan. There's no calcified, there's no non-calcified disease. And basically we exclude coronary artery disease. On purpose, I put this one here because you see that very often we published on this. This is an intramural course. This is not bridging because a CT scan gives you a static picture. And for bridging the diagnosis, you need a dynamic picture. You need to see if the compression is taking place during the cardiac cycle. This is um, uh, intramural course. We looked at, I think, 1000 in total of these scans and the outcome was absolutely the same as if you have non-coronary, you no know, coronary disease. So we see this relatively often if you do CT scans, but it's totally benign. So we're very good in ruling out if there is no calcium, no non-calcified atherosclerosis, no stenosis, then basically this patient does not have coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. What about the prognosis then of CT scans? This is uh, 14,000 patients that we have been doing in the past, mean follow-up uh, two years. A normal CT scan has a mortality less than 1%. Basically, that means that is the same as a normal, you know, normal healthy individual. Non-obstructive coronary artery disease is higher, 1.99. Non-high risk CAD is higher, 2.9. And if you go towards high risk CAD, it goes up to 5%. So it gives you a very good marker to exclude and to estimate your risk. So what if my CT is positive? And on purpose, I took this older one, 
not the perfect picture. I see calcium. I see some non-calcified stuff. Here I have a step artifact. There's non-calcified something. There's calcified something there. Here is a lesion. So yes, the CT is certainly positive. This patient has atherosclerosis, has a combination of calcified and non-calcified atherosclerosis. Together with Hans Reiber, we developed this software. This is the Medis software. That is his company. And um, you see here how that works based on these different steps. You can get a complete uh, quantitative assessment of the presence, extent, severity of uh, coronary atherosclerosis. To put it simple, I always use these factors and we have developed a very simple scoring system and our fellows, they score according to that system. We published it in Jack with a calculator in it, um, I think in 2019. Uh, where we look at the plaque extent according to the different AHA, the 16 uh, segment model. We look at the plaque location because a distal lesion is probably less risky than a very proximal lesion. And we look at plaque severity, how obstructive is it? Based on that, the CATS RAT score has been developed. There are many of these scores. Um, and this is based on plaque location number of segments, the plaque severity, but also, and that's something that we pushed very hard, the plaque composition. A non-calcified lesion is probably higher risk than a calcified lesion. And this is then being summed in one score and there are many of these scores and you can work with whatever you want. What is important, what I said is this plaque constitution. So I give you an example. We published already in 2011 on that here you see Nothing. You see calcified lesions, but there's also some non calcified stuff going on. We compared these with intravascular ultrasounds. And we analyzed that with this uh, software that you see here. And this green is fibro fatty, and this red is inflamed, and the white is calcified. And then recently we shifted more to these approaches where you can much better classify and quantify this amount of. Uh, non-calcified stuff. Are these lesions vulnerable plaques? Is this biology hinting in the direction of inflammation? There isn't that much, but this is the work we did together with Jim Min on the big database that we have built. And you see here a per patient analysis, and I see here a per lesion analysis. And if I look at per patient analysis, these are the patients presenting with acute coronary syndromes, and these are the control patients. And the differences are as follows. The patients with an acute coronary syndrome have a bigger total plaque volume. That's not so surprising. But they also have more of these two. The orange is the necrotic core and the gray is the fibro fatty. These two factors, if you see that in your patient's CT, indicating significantly higher risk for an ACS. How did we do this? We looked at the patients that had a CT scan and shortly after developed uh, either an acute infarction or an ACS. And this was very clear that this was much more prevalent. There's also calcified disease, but a lot of these lesions that eventually trigger the event um, have non-calcified disease. Um, we've also done that on per lesion. And there you see exactly the same, more plaque volume and more of these two components. So non-calcified means something, especially if the patient comes with, let's say, rapid progressive angina. So what if my CT is positive? Let's take it back to the clinics now. We're seeing this patient. When should I revascularize? How am I going to manage? So we have now this development of this FFR CT. A lot of people using this um, FFR CT is basically your calculation of the FFR, fractional flow reserve from the CT scan. You first need to have an anatomical 3D coronary tree model. Then you do computational fluid dynamics. You simulate the coronary physiology and that calculates a vessel specific FFR. It is mostly run by HeartFlow, the company where you send your CT and then they send back to you the consequence or the, the measurements of that, what is the FFR. But this is also coming from other companies that allow that you can do it in your own place. These are the pictures, conventional data stack. You develop this 3D model, you apply the coronary physiology, then is the computer calculations on fluid dynamics. And from that, you develop this module where you see aortic root, 
you see there coronary, FFR 0.86, FFR 0.75, FFR 0.95. FFR CT, if we compare that with invasive FFR, as you see here, it's not 100% comparable, but it's pretty good uh, agreement. And if you look for the accuracy, both the FFR CT and the FFR derived uh, invasively have basically the same area under the curve. Give you a couple of examples here. You see the CT scan. This is a CT stenosis 70 to 90%. There's that stenosis. We do an FFR 0.94. We do an FFR CT 0.93, exactly the same value. This is another example. You see here the right coronary artery. Stenosis more than 90%. FFR 0.65 positive. FFR CT is 0 0.56. These numbers are not exactly the same, 0 0.65, 0 0.56, but they give you the same clinical information. Here's the other coronary, diffuse atherosclerosis, invasive FFR uh, 0.71, FFR CT 0.75. So it gives you indeed the same information. This was then further looked at in the advanced study uh, where John Leipzig from Canada, Vancouver was uh, the driving force behind that. The primary objective from the registry that they did, big registry, 5,000 patients in total, whether the integration of FFRCT as an adjunct to coronary CTA will lead to a significant change in the management of coronary disease in patients with unstable, in, with patients with stable angina. So it's a total of 5,000 patients, as I said, 50 sites uh, all over the world. And um, the use of data from coronary CT and FFRCT to determine the management plan. How am I going to manage my patient? And the topic of this research was, if I do a CT alone, or if I combine it with an FFRCT, am I then getting closer to my final management? Um, optimal medical therapy, PCI, bypass graft surgery, these are the three possibilities. The primary endpoint of the registry is the reclassification rate between the management plan based on CT alone versus CTA plus FFRCT. Okay, so this is the flowchart. Patient comes in, coronary CTA for stable angina, not unstable angina. Meets this inclusion exclusion criteria, then the CTA is performed. <clears throat> and when the CTA is performed, we can decide if the CTA shows a lot of atherosclerosis to do an FFR CT, specifically if the stenosis appears more than 50%. So here you see two patients of this advanced registry or the brute. Here's the one coronary, there's the other. And you see that here an FFR 0.81, that's good. Point FFR 0.91, that's good. But this one less than 50. And this patient was thus revascularized. This patient has three, 0 0.89, 0 0.83, 0 0.91 good and is treated medically. And then they showed actually over a time frame of 360 uh, days <clears throat> that if your FFR is positive, that means no good, that the outcome of these patients as compared to the patients that were treated medically based on a good FFR, you see that there is a significant difference in terms of cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. So I'm not talking here about revascularization. It's just a difference between cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. What also became clear, because they're managed according to uh, what the FFR says, that if the FFR CT was positive, this amount of people got only coronary angiography, but about one third were uh, treated with revascularization. If you compare that with the negative FFR CT, just a few got an invasive angiogram and almost nobody got PCI and nobody got cabbage. So it works well as a gatekeeper. So the conclusions from that part is that first CTA, no atherosclerosis or non-obstructive, just medical therapy. If the stenosis appears more than 50%, you do a CTFFR. Then your findings on the CTFFR, if it's less than 0.8, invasive coronary angiography plus PCI, cabbage if needed. If it's more than 0.8, you do medical therapy. And this uh, concept is um, used by Pam Douglas in the um, platform study. Here you see all the patients. And this is the usual care cohort that they did. So they all go for invasive coronary angiography. And based on that, this group of people get revascularized. 
and this 70% of uh, the total population doesn't have obstructive, so doesn't need a revascularization. Then they say, what about if I would have taken all these patients and I would have had a CTA plus FFR in between? I could take out 60% of the patients and I would stay with 40%, where, 30%, where, th one, where uh, 75% of them actually needs revascularization. So this could be considered as a gatekeeper before you go to the cat lab. And this is what's happening basically now in a lot of uh, cardiovascular laboratories. Just for completeness, you can also do a CTA perfusion. Here you see uh, the angiogram, and this is uh, significant stenosis. If we then do a stress perfusion map, you see that there is significant uh, hypoperfusion, which you see here. And I'm gonna say to you, this perfusion is a good technique, but you can also see that it's hard to differentiate between the normal perfused and the hypoperfused, plus the fact that it comes with a lot of radiation. However, if we compare the stress and the rest, it's very clear that there is hypoperfusion here, there's normal perfusion there, so this is the area of ischemia. The radiation is in the direction of, let's say, 12 millisievert, so this is not uh, used in the clinics. I'm gonna skip these two. I'm gonna come back now to the different part of our patients. We're now gonna talk about the patients that have an intermediate to high likelihood pretest probability. If they have no ischemia, they shift to a low post-test probability. If they have yes ischemia, they shift to a high post-test probability. Let's keep it simple. 61 year old, outpatient clinics, chest pain at rest, sometimes stress, pretest likelihood what? So we do the calculation, typicality, the age, and the gender. This patient has a pretest probability of 44%. Symptomatic patient, high pretest likelihood, he will have coronary disease. The problem or a question is, does he have ischemia and do I need to consider an intervention? So we order a non-invasive ischemia test. This is, I still like this much, this ischemic cascade. The time from onset of ischemia, if it happens early, you can do hypoperfusion assessment with perfusion imaging. And if it happens later, you can do systolic imaging. Most of the tests basically combine now perfusion with systolic one more motion. And then only later in the cascade comes ECG changes and angina. This was published several times, but if you look in the clinics, it's also very often that these things occur already quite early. So it's not a law but it's basically what often we see. Okay, so what ischemia test do we have? This goes back to our guideline. This is the diagnosis of CAD, sensitivity, specificity. And these are all the tests here and you see them, echo, SPECT, MRI, PET scans, everything. All of them have a relatively good sensitivity. Some are higher and they have a pretty good specificity and also some are higher, but they're basically all in the same ballpark. The only thing that jumps out is the low sensitivity of an exercise ECG. Why do we still have this in our ESC guidelines? That's because what I told you in the beginning, a lot of patients are coming from countries in the East of Europe. And in the East of Europe, there is huge uh, lack of advanced imaging. They use a lot exercise ECG. So the guideline that we publish is meant for entire Europe, entire and outside Europe also, but it's written by people coming from all over the place in Europe. And so that means that a lot of them use this and this is why we put this in, but this is the caveat. Okay, so let's take a nuclear perfusion scan, for example. We have a stress defect that disappears at rest. Here's the defect, disappears at rest. Then this whole area is the extent of ischemia. As um, Dr. Zogby said, I worked in the beginning of my career in, in nuclear imaging. That's where I started. And um, there was one person that I would like to mention here that has always been very, very kind to me. And that was Mario Varani, who comes from your clinic. I remember when he was very sick that he sent me a mail that I still have, that he was hoping that I would make uh, something good out of my life. So I tried to listen to him. And uh, that's why I started basically this whole fellowship program. So we have different techniques. We have the SPECT and the PET studies. Here you see the SPECT studies has a little bit less resolution than the PET studies, but basically give you the same information. We can do also 
stress echocardiography. I started with nuclear and then I started to do more research in echo. Uh, and then I built in Leiden a pretty big echocardiography lab because I think echo is the mainstay and stress echo is the one that we do a lot. Uh, so you compare the resting wall motion with the low dose and the high dose and resting situation. We combine it often with contrast, as you see here, because this is not a very good picture and I cannot see the wall motion. And then if you give the contrast, you see it pretty well. So basically all stress echoes are being done with the use of contrast. We can do an MRI. Of course, the resolution is much better. We have done some of this, but we do, I don't know how many MRIs per week, but certainly not the same amount of stress echoes. So the workhorse that we have is um, stress echocardiography and to some extent stress nuclear imaging. We can also do MRI perfusion. It's beautiful. When I saw this scan, I thought this, this cannot be, this must be an artifact, this high uh, subendocardial perfusion problem. But this is the angiogram of that same patient. And you see that indeed he has severe tree vessel disease. So that's a very sensitive technique, but um, uh, operator dependent, program dependent, and also interpretation can sometimes be difficult. So we're back to this picture now patient with angina and dyspnea and suspected coronary artery disease, we have a lot of different diagnostic pathways. But the main pathways are, do we go in with a CT scan or do we start immediately with an ischemia test? Why, when do we do a CT scan? Low clinical likelihood, patient characteristics, um, local expertise, very important, and no history of coronary disease. Then you go in with a CT scan. If it's positive, sometimes we, we decide only for medical treatment, and otherwise we go for invasive coronary angiography with immediate treatment or first functional assessment and then treatment. If the patient has a higher likelihood and revascularization is likely, again, the local expertise and availability and viability you might wanna see, then you go in with an imaging test for ischemia and or viability. And this is where you go in directly with invasive angiography, high clinical likelihood, severe symptoms, refractory or medical therapy, typical angina at low level exercise, LV dysfunction, suggestive of coronary disease, all of those go directly here. Of course, this is very subjective and it gives on purpose the possibility for the clinician to decide what he wants to do when. So let's go back to our patients. We did that. We saw that the post-test probab the, um, the probability was more than 15%. We saw actually significant amount of ischemia. So the patient was revascularized. Symptomatic patients, detection of coronary artery disease, went to revascularize the noses more than 90% or ischemia anyway. That comes from this trial, the ischemia trial. I have the original slides here from the first presentation at the AHA in 2019. Stable patients, moderate or severe ischemia, blinded CTA, then the randomized invasive optimal medical therapy, cardiac uh, catheterization and optimal revesc, or a conservative with optimal medical therapy alone and cath reserved for optimal medical therapy failure. So basically, invasive or non-invasive. And these were the results. You all know those. Primary outcome was cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest, broad comprehensive endpoint. And this is the cumulative incidence. And the outcomes were not significantly different. There's one point that I say, well, after three years, you start to see some difference. It's not significantly different, but I think that still needs some more evaluation on the longer run, what the outcomes would be. This is the major secondary cardiovascular death or infarction. Also that shows the trend for later uh, differentiation, but in this five years follow-up, it was still completely non-different. And this is the net clinical benefit, cardiovascular death and all the others, no difference. So then I come back and I said, so no more tests, should we give them all medical therapy? What do we do now? So I'm gonna give you two short stories. And that makes the case that we always think about um, survival, but at the end of the day, the symptomatic problem is very important. I had to give a lecture at Valentin Fuster's meeting uh, quite some years ago. And um, I was in the train coming from Washington, going to New York. 
and I was working my computer and next to me was sitting some sort of a businessman and uh, he was doing his work. I was doing my work. And at some moment he, he said to me, so well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm preparing lecture that I have to do there uh, at the medical meeting. And he said, ah, oh, you're a physician. Uh, you physicians, you do a great job because my brother, he just went, he couldn't walk anymore. He went to an orthopedic clinics and they replaced the hip and look at him now, perfectly cured. So I thought to myself, hmm. And then the stenosis with angina is the other story, just missing the criteria for revascularization. That's one of my own patients. So this patient come to me, has had multiple PCIs over his life. And each time it presents with um, rapidly growing angina, shorter walking distance. And an interesting fact is that he then starts to often develop atrial fibrillation. So that triggers the question, is that related to the ischemia or non-ischemia or but how does, it, anyhow. So I sent the patient to the cat lab and I didn't do any testing. I know that he has severe coronary artery disease. I have the history that each time when he has that, he's sort of relieved of his symptoms if we send him to the cat lab and he's being treated. So now he goes to the treat uh, to the cat lab. They do an FFR and he just misses the criterion for revascularization. So a couple of weeks later, I'm seeing him at the, at the outpatient clinic and I asked him, so how do you feel? He said, well, I feel lousy. I said, well, I'm sorry, what happened to you? And he said, yeah, they didn't revascularize. So I look at the chart and I see they didn't revascularize. Yeah, why not? Because the FFR just didn't make it. So I go to my friend who is um, the head of the cat lab and I said to him, can you please look at him again? Because this, this patient actually, he he has this history that each time we do a PCI, he's relieved for quite some time. I give him maximal medical therapy. Can you please take a look? So he finds the same thing. He does the revascularization anyway. The patient comes back in a couple of weeks and he sits there in front of me and he says, I feel great. I can do anything again. And the atrial fibrillation didn't come back. So these are just case reports. But the point I want to make, and that is what I what I did at the Fuster Symposium, I I put forward that comment that it's not always that we have to strive for longevity. It's more and more an emphasis on quality of life. Look at our heart failure patients. We treat them with, I don't know what, but each time we realize that based on the treatments that we give, we're not prolonging so much their life, but we prolong their quality of life, how they live uh, their life with less symptoms. I'm going to give you just as a sidestep, a very small story, because I see on my clock here that I have 10 minutes. Um, so this is a patient of mine, and he is a tertiary referral. He has ischemic cardiomyopathy, has a big heart. He cannot be revascularized. He had multiple PCIs. He had cabbage, and uh, they have no solution for him in the, um, in the uh, different hospitals where he has been. So he comes to me and I do the echo. I see a very big um, left ventricular uh, dilatation, very big heart, of course, secondary mitral regurgitation. We do another angiogram. There's no possibilities for revascularization anymore. We do a mitral clip and we're not gonna make him live longer. But his main thing was in life, he was a very successful businessman. And he said to me, I said, what do you expect of life if we're going to treat you? And he said, well, you know, at my age, 90 plus, I've done everything. But here in the Netherlands, they have this thing that they like very much, which is when the salted herrings are available, they like to eat the salted herrings. So I said to him, you cannot take a salted herring with your situation. And he said, well, it's the only thing that I would really like. So I said, okay, we give you the mitral clip and you take a lot of diuretics just before you eat the salted herring. You do no more than once a month. And I've been seeing him for three years onwards after that he died, but he was living very happily with eating a salted herring. And with this big uh, diuretics before the mitral clip, he managed for a couple of years extra. So I'm, I'm bringing the point to you that whatever we do in medical, we got to think about um, do we treat for longevity or do we treat for symptoms? I'd like to conclude um, everything that I've been saying to you. So lower pretest likelihood, first CTA, that's basically what everybody's now doing. If it's no atherosclerosis, perfect. If it's non-obstructive, we do medical therapy. If there's a significant stenosis, 
We sometimes refer them for FFR, otherwise we do another ischemia test and then we revascularize if needed. In the higher pretest likelihood, we start with an ischemia test. If there's ischemia, we revascularize. If there's no ischemia, we give medical therapy. And then I didn't write that first, that third sentence under that, but the third sentence is for all of us clinicians is that always think in the position of the patient. And if the tests don't meet exactly what we wanted them to look like, just give it your clinical view, position yourself in the patient's situation, and sometimes you revascularize if it doesn't meet exactly the criteria. I want to thank you very much. I hope that um, um, next time I can be with you. I have already looked at the schedule with Dr. Zogby, so let's see if it works. Um, I will be fully available next year, and I really apologize that I couldn't be with you live, but I hope this was a good surrogate. I thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, really a wonderful presentation, putting things in, in context of uh, the whole spectrum of coronary disease from the asymptomatic individual <clears throat> to somebody who is quite symptomatic. And, and importantly, I think the points that you mentioned towards the end is that we have to put it in the clinical context and at times you know it may not fit exactly and uh, i think it's another reminder for us that some of these criteria are not rigid it is not an all or none phenomenon and ffr be it invasive or non-invasive is a continuum and most of the time we take a look at it in a resting position as opposed to when the patient exercises. And many things, particularly in the borderline areas, change. You don't know what the blood pressure response is to that particular individual, where are so many other things that would determine whether you have ischemia, yes or no. So to me, I think that's also very important to put it together in the clinical context. So we have, we have a couple of questions here. Um, first, uh, thank you for your interesting lecture. Would you need absolutely perfect coronary CTA for CTFFR to be done? At times, the images are not perfect or optimal because of obesity or faster heart rate. What do you do in those situations? Do you, would you refer them to a CTFFR? Yeah, I think we've been doing quite some of that with the, with the company, heart flow, and we saw that in often the uh, the, the assessment is not uh, impossible. If we get it back and it's uh, impossible, we go to another test. But basically, I've tried it several times, and it's not it's definitely not impossible. Other question is that recent, most recent data suggests that. Uh, CTFFR is less accurate than initially thought. For example, a recent study two weeks ago in Jack Imaging shows that mm -hmm. the specificity may be low, 32% positive predictive value, about 50% convey, compared to invasive FFR. Does the cost uh, justify using it despite low accuracy, or are there situations where you probably would not do that? And at least I would put this in context also of the borderline lesions. This is where, you know, I think some yeah. other methodology is needed because it is not as good in these borderline lesions. Exactly the same uh, opinion we have. We've been working long time with the CT. We, we, we started with that at the very early stage and uh, we see exactly what you say. And, and CT, I showed you this quantifications, et cetera. <laughs> that tell us a lot, but um, the CT quality varies significantly. And specifically when the quality is not very good, which is not infrequent, um, then the FFR results are also not that good. So I also share with you that if it's around the, uh, yeah, what do you take as a cutoff? 70%, 80% stenosis. Um, <clears throat> and when it's around this intermediate, there is not that much information. And it's especially there where we need more information. Um, I do it. I also noticed that sometimes we get uh, results that are disappointing. Still, I think as a first test, it is okay. If I feel that um, I would expect differently, then usually we use a stress echo in the own lab, or sometimes we use a stress nuclear scan. I don't do much ischemia testing with MRI. I indicated that to you because um, availability. Um, but that's more or less how we approach it. We also, I must say, switch quite easily to invasive if we 
don't get completely the picture that we want to, um, that, that it doesn't <laughs> fit the clinical picture. It's great to put all the, I mean, nowadays, as opposed to 10 plus years ago, we have so many other modalities for us to choose from. Uh, at times that can be daunting to some individuals, you know, particularly maybe the primary care physician at times who just sees so many things. So education in this field, I think, uh, is, is going to be really crucial for people to use it more appropriately, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe a last question for you that's from me is, uh, what do you think, and I, I use that often and many other people use it often, is combining a calcium score with a physiologic test, meaning to think longevity-wise to reduce the risk of an individual, particularly in view of data from this institution, John Mamerian and Sumin Chang and other institutions too, showing that in somebody who has a normal stress nuclear, and conceivably you could extrapolate that to a stress echo or other physiologic testing, is that from a longevity point of view on how aggressive you want to be in reducing, right, reducing the risk, a calcium score married with a physiologic test may be good because a high calcium score, you know, impacts a lower prognosis. And some patients come to you and said, oh, doc, I just had a, a stress test and it was normal. And about three, four weeks ago, I had an acute myocardial infarction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've seen those also. I remember very clearly, I saw it for the first time, was a patient of mine, diabetic patient. These are often the most difficult, I think, to, to predict things. He had a normal nuclear test, and also within a month, he had a myocardial infarction. I still have him on my outpatient clinic. He never, ever afterwards had anything anymore. Now he developed atrial fibrillation so many years later, but no more ischemic uh, events. But I think your approach is very elegant. So the calcium score gives you the 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 ID, is, is this patient completely clean of atherosclerosis and therefore the normal nuclear test, or is there nothing inducible at this moment in time, but he has atherosclerosis, which in itself is related with uh, events over time. I think that is a very nice approach. Um, honestly, I've never been looking at that. We usually do calcium score immediately plus CT angiogram. And if I'm then not happy, I do an ischemia test. Um, but it's a very nice way to do it. It's something that I could probably also introduce with us. I like it very much. Um, I also wanted to say that that I really regret that I cannot be with you because I was looking so forward because so many years ago, I remember uh, all the papers you you published on echocardiography um, and all the big stuff on uh, nuclear and then uh, indeed with Dr. Mamarian, everything on calcium. I was always reading all the, I still am reading all these articles coming out. And so I really was hoping to spend some time with you. So it's a pity that we couldn't do that. I hope that we have a chance uh, in the next year to do that. We will definitely. And I want to thank you again for taking the time. And, uh, and, and sharing your thoughts with us on, on coronary disease and using various modalities to do that. So hope to see you also at the ACC. Thanks again, Jerome. With great pleasure. It was a pleasure having you here among us.